get our hymn books, please, if you would. Turn to 162. We'd like for you to stand and join with the choir as we sing, To God Be the Glory. Shall us all stand, please? Sing 162. people said? Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Father, we sure do thank you for this day that you've given to us. We sure thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship you this morning, and I pray that you'll help us to do so in spirit and in truth. And Father, how I pray you'll bless this service. I pray for a mighty outpouring of the power of God to rest upon this place today. I pray you'll continue to bless the singing now I pray that you'll prepare hearts for the preaching of your word. I pray that you'll help our preachers. He'll come in just a bit. and He'll open the word of God. And I pray you'll speak to him and through him to every heart and every life. And Father, how we pray this morning. If there be one here that does not know you as their personal Savior, may this be the day they get that settled forever in eternity. And Father, how I pray that you'll move in our midst now. And we'll sure thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do. Tell you, Lord, that we sure do love you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. The choir may be seated as well. We're glad you're here. Thank you for coming and being a part of the service at Mount Pisgah Baptist Church this morning. If you're here today and you're visiting for the first time or the first time in a long time, you're our special guest today. We have a gift for you that we'll give you at the end of the service, but we have a visitor's card and ink pen that we'd like to give to you now. We'd ask that you take just a few moments and fill out the uh, visitor's card and drop it in the offering plate when we receive the offering in just a bit. So if you're visiting for the first time or the first time in a long time, would you raise your hand way up high? Our ushers are going to be making their way from the back to the front, and they'll be with you just in a moment. So keep your hands way up high so they can see. Thank you all for coming. Amen. Good to have you this morning. Amen. All right. Some folks right here, Brother Terry. I think Brother Joe's got... Got them right there. Good deal. Okay. Got them. Okay. Did we miss anyone? Okay. Thank you for being our guest today. 
Uh, I'll remind all of you, there is a green prayer request card in the songbook rack in front of you. If you have a special request that you'd like for us to pray with you about, write that request in and drop it in the offering plate. We'll receive the offering, and we'll take those requests and mention them from the pulpit, and we'll have prayer just for the special needs that you write in. I'm being reminded, thank you, Brother David, if you are here this morning and did not get a bulletin when you came in, all the announcements that uh, are mentioned for the week are in the bulletin. If you would like to have a bulletin, you didn't get one when you came in, if you'll hold your hand way up high, our ushers will bring you one, okay? We have some here in the center section and some right here as well. All right, just hold your hand way up high for a minute and we'll get to you. Brother Joe, Brother Terry, here with Port Woods, and then J.R., Right here, Brother Terry, in the center section. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Once again, glad you're here. Thank you for coming. Right now, the choir is going to stand and sing for us while the ages roll. again please let's turn to 439 we'd like for you to stand and join with us as we sing count your blessings Sing. 
right, let's fellowship together as the choir comes down. Shake hands with those around you. Tell them it's good to see them in the house of the Lord this morning. men to come. We'll receive the offering this morning. Brother Rick Gaylor, I want you to come up and pray for us if you would, please. Precious Lord, we thank you, dear Lord, for your love and many blessings today. Yes. We pray, to those, Lord, that you'll be with this service, that your will will be done in everyone's heart. Pray, dear Lord, that you'll use this offering, dear Lord, for your mighty word to outreach to the community and to this world. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Rick. May the Lord bless us as we give this morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. We can certainly testify to that. As we do, and I know they're still taking up the offering. We're just trying to get a few extra minutes in this morning, all right? But uh, as we have done since our nation's been at war, on Sunday mornings we've been having you to stand for individuals you know that's in the military. And uh, we'll do that again this morning. If you know someone serving presently in our military, I want you to stand where you are. We're going to pray for them today. We're going to pray for our nation today. We're going to pray for our leaders today. And I want you to think of that person. You're standing there that you know. And I want you to ask God to help them and watch over and protect them. And bless our president and our military. Brother Harvey, why don't you come and pray for us this morning? Would you do that for us this morning? Father, we stand again in gratefulness to you for your wonderful mercy and grace upon our nation, upon our yes. people, and upon us. 
And Lord, Father, we ask now this morning as we all gather here in this troublesome time, Father, when there's trouble on every hand and the enemy assails uh, the believers as we turn to our life's duties, but Lord, we ask that you will give us strength to be faithful and to honor you. And Lord, that our hearts and our dependence will be upon you and not upon anything that man can do or anything we can do ourselves. But Father, our, our hope and our trust is in thee. And Father, for all of these that are in the minds and the hearts of these people here this morning, we pray a special blessing upon them today. Somehow, some way, Lord, let them know that they're being prayed for. And Father, that we are yes. caring yes. and that we're grateful for all that you have done thus far. Yes. Continue to be with us and lead our country and our nation. For yes. Christ's sake, we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated, please. I want you to be thinking of someone that you know who in the past, they've already gone to be with the Lord, but I want you just to think of someone you know that uh, used to serve the Lord in some capacity. And uh, we couldn't recognize all of them, but we'll do something a little bit special in just a few minutes. Gloria, if you ready. One of the things that uh, I love about this church is that we still sing the old gospel hymns of days gone by. Uh, there, you, you'll find in many of these songs there is a common thread. For instance, if I mentioned I'll Fly Away or The Unclouded Day, In the Sweet By and By, songs that were born out of difficult times speaks of a better land, a better time. The scriptures calls it the blessed hope. I ran across a song about a year ago and uh, I fell in love with the song and I wanted to introduce it to the group and we decided to sing it. Uh, I was talking to Sister Helen Friels about it. And she was telling me that this song she sang years ago as just a young girl in the old singing schools. And I wanted you to listen to it. The, the title of the song is Better Farther On. As we travel through the desert, storms beset us by the way. But beyond the river Jordan lies a field of endless day. Farther on, still go farther, count the milestones one by one. Jesus will forsake you never. It is better farther on. Oh, my brother, are you weary of the roughness of the road? Does your strength begin to fail you? Let the Savior bear your load farther on still go farther count the milestones one by one jesus will forsake you never it is better farther on at my grave will still be singing though you weep for one that's gone sing it as we once did sing it it is better farther on farther on still go farther Count the milestones one by one. Jesus will forsake you never. It is better farther on. Farther on, still go farther. Count the milestones one by one. Jesus will forsake you never. It is better farther on. I'm 
honor to introduce to you this morning, either we're not in our Sunday school class, Brother Alan Ironside. Over 40 years in India serving God. And uh, all the numbers he could give you, the schools that have started and the preacher people that are over India is just astonishing. I'm glad God has used him there. I'm glad to call him my friend. Brother Ironside, you come and take a few minutes. Just talk about your work for a few minutes. God bless you. God bless your heart. It's an honor for me to be with you today. It was my privilege to meet Pastor Wall uh, in India three years ago. And I didn't get to know him that well, but just the short time we were with him in Dr. Cherian School in the Baptist Bible College in South India, I noticed one thing that somewhat my heart was made to realize this, that he loved the Lord. And that, for me, is very important. It's not enough just to have something up here, but a man, a woman who loves the Lord, who loves the Lord. And that's what I appreciated about your pastor. And I thank God for a man who loves the Lord and who wants to honor him. And I want to thank the Lord for the privilege of being with you today, for your concern, for your fellowship, and for your support too in our lives. We thank you from our hearts. If my wife was here today, I know she'd want to greet you. She has a lot more than I got, but anyway, I got to do the best I can, you understand? So I want to convey her greetings to you too this morning. And I know she'll be with us in prayer. God blessed me with a wonderful wife. I crossed over the seas to India, and I met my wife in India, brother. I used to wonder why all my college mates are getting married. I was one of the few guys with a car those days in Bible College in Calgary, Canada, and they'd want my car for their engagement parties, for their whatever they wanted, and I had no girl or nothing much, it seemed. And not, and I wasn't really interested, worried about it. But I went to India, and there God gave me a beautiful Irish lass, really Scottish and Irish. Her father was a converted Irishman and her mother was a Scots lady uh, they were there when the British ruled in India and God has blessed us so wonderfully we've been married now over 40 years with six children and five grandsons we are wanting some granddaughters but our kids are not cooperating so what can we do about that <laughs> but we're, we're glad and we're grateful to God for what he has done God saved me as I mentioned in the Bible class this morning about 50 years ago almost today just exactly almost 50 years ago today, he made me his own. And uh, I just want to thank the Lord for that. Shortly after that, he called me to serve him. And then I went to college, pastored a church for a short time, a year or so, too, in Canada, did evangelistic work. And then in January 59, left for India. Uh, Pastor Wall mentioned this, and I shouldn't mention it, I suppose, but my total support those days when I left Canada for India was $10 promise support and God supplied it of course $10 those days 40 years ago was about like 50 or $60 today so it's not so bad you understand but for but at least it was $10 a month but my first uh, provision the first month I was out there it was $15 somebody else must have put in $5 somewhere along the line and that's all I needed however and I and I this music that was played just during the offertory Great is thy faithfulness. And really that's what I want to say in these few br brief moments. The faithfulness of God. I left a few cards out there. And you'll notice in the bottom of that little card is 1 Thessalonians 5.24. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. Amen. And I've experienced that. My wife has experienced that. Our family's experienced that time and time and time again. As God has proved his faithfulness in guidance in provision, in delivering, in helping, in healing too. Two of our eldest kids, Bronwyn and Karen, our oldest girls, they came down with TB in the city of Bombay. And I knew we could get them healed by medicine. Uh, the doctor said six weeks of streptomycin, I think it was, and two years of medicine pills will get, it over, get uh, the kids over this sickness. One of our girls had been burned badly, and she was very hyper with needles and everything. I said, Lord, if this girl has to have these needles every day for six weeks in medicine for two years, it's going to be hard on her. And to leave off a lot of detail, God in mercy just cried to him. God healed her and healed the other one also. 
And we have noticed God's, known God's faithfulness so many times. Well, after about 10 years, we returned to Canada back in December, uh, back in uh, May, June 68. We returned to Canada for our first furlough. And then we're returning to India in 69. My wife and I and four children, but we don't have enough money. Those days to fly to Bombay from Calgary, Canada only cost about two and a half thousand dollars. You can't do it today, but those days two and a half thousand dollars. We had about hundred and fifty dollars or so. And I said, Lord, we got to get back there, but how to go? And I remember that morning I was praying in my devotions and somehow I was assured that God would do something. I was happened to be reading in Psalm 119 and I'll just read this verse to you because this has meant a lot to me. Psalm 119 and it says this, I can't even find the reference. Lord, remember the word unto thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope. That's verse 49. And I had some confidence. Now for me, that's that verse that's on that card. 1 Thessalonians 5.24. Remember the word unto which thou hast caused me to hope. Faithful as he who calls you also will do it. And I had some little hope that God's going to do something. Well, we were renting a little two-bit room there for a few months before going back to India. We were paying $40 a month rent on that. That morning, a little colorblind uh, landlady came in and talked to my wife and gave my wife $50. Oh, that's pretty good. We give her $40. She gives us $50. And then we had breakfast. That's before breakfast was finished. I walked out and as I'm going out, my brother was driving by in his car and he held out his hand and he gave me a check for $200. I thought, that's a good way to start a day, isn't it? And I talked to my brother 20, 30 years later about that and he says, I don't remember doing that. And I said, well, you did it. You gave me those $200 out of the, your car door. And I thought, well, man, this is a good day. I go down to the post office. I'm sure going to get something. But you know, there wasn't even a postage stamp there. I was looking for the post office, but I learned, as I've learned many times, where you're looking for it may not come. May not come. But all I want to say is this. Before that day was out, God had provided pretty well enough for us to go back to India. Faithful as he who calls you, who also will do it in so many ways. And I want to thank God for preserving and helping, keeping us going many times. I'm just thinking right now, I just want to say this in closing. This suit of clothes, the suit I've got on, I love this suit. And I'm not wanting another suit. I've got plenty of clothes, so don't think I want any more clothes, all right? I only got one body. I often tell my kids want to buy me a shirt. And I said, listen, I've got one body. I don't need two, two at one time. I only got one pair of shoes. That's enough. I don't need two pairs of shoes. Actually, I've got two pairs of shoes. But I don't need any more. This suit was given to me by a man by the name of Brother Subai, Mr. Subaya. He's a businessman in Bangalore, converted from Hinduism. And he gave me this suit. It's a beautiful suit. I've had it for about four, five, six years or so now. And uh, in fact, these shoes he gave me on a birthday about four years ago, I think. Same man. He's a fairly wealthy businessman, but a man who agonizes. His wife is a Hindu, his mother is a Hindu, his father's dead. His two daughters are Hindus. And his wife just tantalizes him, antagonizes him, makes his life as hard as possible, alienating his daughters from him. A very tender, gentle-hearted man, a helpful man. And if you ever go to Bangalore, he'll be there to help you. He'll be ready to meet you at the airport. I know that, if he can. Many times, Brother Sabai has come to our house in Bangalore, 10, 11 o'clock at night. And this is not unusual for our life in Bangalore, India. 11 o'clock at night, just to share his burden. Tears, praying together. But God has sustained him. And all I'm saying is this, for Brother Subaya, God sustains him. He faces a difficult state, living in a home, where if we send a letter out to him or email, my wife may send an email to them, he may never get it. His wife may say, well, I don't think he needs that letter, you know, because he's got something of the gospel in to encourage him. But yet God sustains him. So when I wear this suit this morning, I'm thinking of Brother Subaya, a converted Hindu man whom God is sustaining. And many, many others like that today in India and of course around the world 
And I want to testify today of the faithfulness of God Amen. in calling, in saving, in keeping, in supplying. When we've never expected or looked for it, God has undertaken. Amen. And I want to thank him today and rejoice with you in the faithfulness of God. Depend upon it. God will not fail. Amen. He cannot fail. Amen. He's pledged his word. He cannot fail. He'll see you through. In the darkest hour. God will see you through. And I want to praise him today. For his faithfulness. And God bless every one of you. Thank you sir. Great honor to have Brother Ironside with us today. Just before the message, but Pastor Wall's joyful heart comes to sing for us, Champion of Love. Gentlemen, may I have your attention? I want to introduce to you in this corner of the good and the right stands a champion robed in white, his hiding seat the heaven. His weight outweighs the world. His reach reaches everywhere. His age is evermore. And he is higher than the highest, greater than the great. No one will ever take his crown away. He's more mighty than the This king who wore their crown And they gladly watched The champion going down
Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter number 3, please. 1 Peter chapter 3. While you're finding that, I need to say several things this morning. If you'll listen closely, we'll get that said and get on with things. <clears throat> I've not mentioned hardly anything about it. I believe, like David Gibbs said, when the devil fell, he fell in the PA system. <laughs> but Thursday morning from 9.30 till 10.30, we have a service here on, on Thanksgiving Day. One hour of total Thanksgiving, that's all we do. You ought to be a part of it. It's the best service of the year, I promise you. You need to be a part of it. You ought to come and do that. I've not mentioned anything about that, but I want you to be able to come to that, please. It's been in the bulletin. Also, we need to be praying about our deacons who will serve for the next few years and those on the buildings and ground as well. Our new CDs are here. Are they, are they, are they beautiful? If you haven't seen them, yet, have you? Brother Harvey, come up here. We dedicate this CD to Brother Harvey. How long have you led the choir here at Mount Pesca Baptist Church? A little over 40 years. Over 40 years. He's led the singing here. Brother Harvey, this is dedicated to you. I appreciate it. For your faith and service. Yes, sir. We appreciate you. Yes, sir. We're not going to embarrass you. Come over here a second. All right, thank you. He didn't want this to be known, but he taught me 50 years ago when I was young. <laughs> and so he doesn't want that to be known. Now, they're on sale, and they're $20. The reason that's more than most CDs cost, we'll use what money we do make to help pay some on the piano. A lot of money's been given on the piano already, probably enough to, to cover the cost. We'll use that for that. Why is it worth so much? Well, inside is a picture of Brother Harvey. That's why, <laughs> that's why it's worth so much money, right? And you can see the folks at your church. God bless you, Brother Harvey. Do you have one? Brother Harvey, do you have one of these? Here, have another one. I'll sell this one, okay. All right, we'll do that. Thank you so much. Do you know anyone that has, anyone here this morning at our church, and several folks are not up here. We have a junior church program. We have a hundred and some people here this morning you don't even see. They're in junior churches and nursery programs and things like that. But if you have served the Lord, we're going to just stay with Mount Pisgah Baptist Church. In some capacity at Mount Pisgah, I mean any capacity, uh, I don't want to start mentioning all this, but choir and nurse or anything, bus drivers or anything. If you've done that for teacher Sunday school class, anything for 10 years, I want you just to stand up for a second. You've done something like for 10 years, you've done something like that. You've taught a class, sung in the choir, helped in the nursery, done some of those things for at least 10 years at Mount Pisgah. At least 10 years at Mount Pisgah. You've done that. Worked on the staff or something. All right. Thank you so much. God bless you. And uh, we appreciate you so much. I just chose that 10 years. Now, if you have a, someone that used to be involved in any ministry at Mount Pisgah, print shop ministry, anywhere, anything, and, uh, but they're already gone to be with the Lord, but you just want to, would you stand just in memory of that person, in honor of that person? Just stand in memory of that person, honor of that person today. And we're just giving thought this month to people we're thankful for. And there's many of them that you know that served here and worked here and labored for years. And I appreciate that. It has been a blessing to this church. And I know some of you have other family members that have been to other churches, and I know you're appreciative of them. May God bless you. And I want to tell you I love you. And I'm thankful to be your pastor. May God bless you. First Peter chapter 3. Have you found that passage? A young man with a speech impediment, like I've got this morning. <laughs> Good to see Matt and Julie with us. That's Michelle's uh, older sister, and uh, we're glad they're here. They all, if, we're in Canada, if we're in Canada traveling home, we get to stay at their house, and Max, Matt fixes burnt hot hamburgers for us. He's not much of a cook, but they got a nice place to stay. <laughs> I appreciate it. Good to see you. We had a fa Jennings family here today. I sat across from the restaurant the other day when we were eating. Good to see you folks and some other folks. Thank you for coming. 
But a young preacher with an impediment of speech means he couldn't talk plain, he stuttered. He went to his preacher and he said, uh, Preacher, said, I feel like God's called me to preach. He said, I know I've got a handicap, but, said, but God wants me to preach. And he said, well, young man said, God's able to overcome that handicap. He said, what you need to do is you just, uh, said, I heard, I read of an orator in history that put gravels in his mouth. And he'd go down by the ocean, he'd put those gravels in his mouth, and, and then he learned how to speak properly with those gravels in his mouth. And the uh, preacher said, now I wouldn't recommend gravels, but said, if you've got some marbles, just try some marbles. So the young man got a bunch of marbles in his mouth, he went down and Every day he'd take a marble out. He got up one day to testify, and he said, after I lost all my marbles, I became a Baptist preacher. Amen? <laughs> and I can say, after I lost all my marbles, I became a Baptist preacher. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Would you stand with me if you're able to? If you're not, you can remain seated. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good. But, and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that they falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ hath also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, who quickens us and made us alive spiritually, and who's promised to quicken our flesh, our mortal bodies, I pray he'd quicken our minds and our ability to receive and our tongues to speak that God be honored in all that we say, that Christians be helped, that the cause of God be advanced. We thank you and love you and praise you with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. There's hardly a Sunday that comes since September the 11th that have not least preached on the incidents that's taken place in America. The first Sunday I preached on they found new gods and there was war in the gates. The second Sunday, in nothing be terrified by your adversaries. The third Sunday, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. And then Dr. David Gibbs was with us. And then last Sunday, when, where is God in the time of crises? And this week again this morning, taking verse number 14 as our text. But if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you, and be not afraid of their terror. Say the word with me, be not afraid of what? Of terror. See, the uh, terrorism is an attack, of course, to make us afraid. And if they can do so and cause us not to enjoy or do what we would normally do, they succeeded to some degree in terrifying us. But Peter is writing this to some Christians two, nearly 2,000 years ago because they too were facing great afflictions in their lives. Look with me, please, back at 1 Peter chapter number 1, please. You're there close by. Look at verse number 6. He says, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold testings or temptations. That the, what of your faith? The trial of your faith. So he mentions that these believers here are going through a time where their faith is tried. Let me ask you a question. Would Peter not be a perfect man to write about the trial of his faith? Remember, it was Peter that the Lord Jesus spoke to and said, he said, Simon, Simon, says Satan has desired to have thee. He wants to sift thee like wheat. He said, but he says, but when thou art, he says, you're going to try your faith. He said, when thou art converted, you strengthen your brethren. So Peter had a trial of his faith that was tested here, just as these believers have in this text of scriptures. But these believers here, if we know something about history, were living under great trials of afflictions. 
See, they were dying. Here's why they were dying. They were dying because they would not refer to, to the leader, the Roman leader, as being a Lord or Caesar as Lord. Christ is Lord. Amen? He's Lord of every situation, Lord of all times, and all of those things. We had time to even deal with that. But Christians also were looked upon as an economic threat because the religion of their days sold commodities, sold things for them to worship with, sold idols for them to worship, and Christians don't worship idols. Listen to me, folks. We don't trade the same place the world trades. And they were looked upon as an economic danger to their community. Also, they were looked upon as being different. They were different. And by the way, if you're ever going to make a difference in this world, you've got to be different. Amen? They were accused of, of incest because a man would call his wife sister or a, or a woman would call her husband brother because they were in Christ. And the unbelieving world said, well, they're incest. They're marrying uh, brothers and sisters. And they accused them of that so falsely. Also, they were accused of cannibalism because when the Christians would take the Lord's Supper, they'd say, we're taking the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. It's representative. We know that and we believe that. But they accused those Christians because they were looking for a way to accuse them. So in the midst of all those things they were going through, Peter writes, and he says to them, don't you be terrified by these people. Don't you let it terrorize you. Now, there's some things we're not to do. Don't be afraid. Don't be troubled. But there are some things we're supposed to do. Look with me, verse number 13 with me, please, if you would. He says this, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Every Christian in this room this morning ought to, ought to make up your mind that you're going to be a real Christian. Amen? You're going to be real in your walk with God and be followers of that which is good, as our text has said. God help us to be followers of that which is good. The second thing, verse number 14. Not only are we to be real, look at verse number 14 with me, please. He said, verse 15, I'm sorry, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and tell me the next word, and be what? Ready. Be ready. We're to be ready. We're supposed to be real, and we're supposed to be Ready. Look at verse number 14 with me again, though. He says, And if you suffer for righteousness' sake, tell me, tell me the word, happy are ye. Here's what we're to be in this generation when we are terrorized on each side. We're to be real in verse number 13. In verse number 14, we're supposed to rejoice in times of suffering. That's hard to do, isn't it? Is it easier to preach than it is to practice? Yes, it is. And thirdly, we're to be ready. And my admonition to you this morning is this, that every one of us be real in our walk with God, that we be rejoicing in tribulations and be ready to answer every man of the hope that's within us. But now I'm going to tell you how you can do it because the text outlines it for us. Look with me again in verse number 15 with you, please. But tell me the next word, after, after the word, word, after the first word, but what? Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. This means this, folks. If you're going to be real, and if you're going to rejoice in times of affliction, and if you're going to be ready to give an answer, you better make sure that Jesus Christ has a special place in your life. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. I want to thank, and I didn't know Brother, know Brother Arnside would say what he said this morning. And I graciously appreciate what he had to say. Because I want to tell you something, folks. If we don't love the Lord, we don't have anything we love like we are to love the Lord. Amen? Amen. Sanctify. It gives Jesus Christ special to you. That's what I mean. See, we live with Jesus Christ secondary in our lives. We're going to serve God if we don't have something else to do. Or we're going to love God if we don't have something else we love better. But I want to tell you, you are to sanctify. You are to set Christ above everything else in your life. I read a statement about Charles Spurgeon, one of the, the greatest preachers probably of, of our times. Here's what Charles Spurgeon said. Listen. He said, If the professed convert declares that he knows the will of God, but he does not mean to attend to it, you're not to pamper his presumption, but it's your duty to assure him he is not saved. Boy, that's powerful. He said, if a man would say he loves God but doesn't want to obey God, let's assume him not even being saved. 
Oh, listen to me. Always keep in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. Stay in love with Jesus. That's the best advice I can give you. The first thing, if you want to be real, if you want to be rejoicing, you want to be ready, you set Christ apart, make him real. The second thing I want to say to you is you need to be ready with an answer. You know, people are asking, people are asking, is your faith real? Isn't it interesting on most of the TV talk programs when they get somebody on there, especially if they're a religious person, this is the one of the questions they ask him. It says, was your faith shaken when this happened? Isn't that the question they all ask all of them? Isn't your faith shaken? Well, listen, I'm not surprised when a dog barks. I'm not surprised when a cat meows. And I'm not surprised when wickedness does wickedly. Now, I'm surprised sometimes at the catastrophe of all that takes place. But I want to tell you, my faith still firm in Jesus Christ. And listen, we need to be ready with an answer when people ask us, what do we believe? Listen to me. Is your life so live before others that they see your faith in Christ, what you're going through, and they say, boy, I want what they've got because they're facing it properly in the Lord. Ready to give an answer. Ready with an answer of what God says to you. The day that my brother funeral was going to be. I was reading the scriptures. Let me show you a verse God gave me in Psalm 57. Psalm 57. This verse meant much to me that day. Psalm 57. My family could never thank you enough, and I'm detouring a little bit, how kind you were to our family during the time of my brother's homecoming this last week. It meant so much to us. Psalm 57, verse number 1. Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me. Psalm 57, are you with me? Verse 1. For my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I said, God, I must get under your wings. <laughs> and I'm just going to abide under the shadow of the Almighty till these calamities be overpassed. When someone would say, when they'd see me and I had to continue my duties of doing so, how do you carry on? I'll tell you how I carry on. I'm ready to give you an answer this morning. The answer is that I still believe in the Christ of Calvary. And I believe that there's a better life for we that know God. Amen? And I believe there's a heaven that's real, don't you? Amen. I believe it. And it's sweeter every day. It's sweeter every day. Third reason, if you want to be real, if you want to be rejoicing in affliction, if you want to be ready, learn to walk in humility. Walk in humility. Look at verse number 15. He says, he says, you give an answer to every man that asks you of the reason, the hope that is in you with what? With meekness and fear. Can I tell you that meekness is not weakness, but meekness is strength under control. Amen. Would you not think that Jesus Christ is a meek person? Boy, he had power, didn't he? Moses, the meekest man that ever lived in the Old Testament time, but he was a man of great power to walk in meekness. <coughs> Fear is trembling at the sight of something. Meekness is maybe showing some fearfulness, but trusting in God to deliver you. See, our boasting this morning is not in ourselves. Our boasting is in the Lord. You know, I, I don't, I, I've not said this. I, you've, you've heard me tell this story about Brother Arnside. He's never heard me tell, you, tell this story because this is the first time I've seen him since I left India. And I'll say this in his presence. I remember the day you came on the property where I was. You came in from Bangor, and we were down in the part of South India. And I remember when I, when I met you, and we were sitting at a little table in a room eating. And Brother Arne said, honestly, I just felt like I was in the presence of God. Because I knew of your life, and I'd heard about it. But being around him, you'd know he's not a man that boasts of anything he's done. He continually brags on the faithfulness of God. I told Brother Harvey, I think this week, or I spoke to someone. I've had the privilege of being around some of the best men. Dr. J. Harold Smith. Huh? 91 years of age. Preached here last April. We got to be his friend. His daughter, and I can't believe this, his daughter called us and said, Dr. J.R. Smith loved you and your church so much, I wanted you to know personally about his home going. But if he was ever around that powerful man who
Do I feel like I had as much prayer with God as any man ever met as well as Brother Armstrong? He walked in humility. So humble. Listen, folks, Christianity is not cockiness. It's walking in the fear of God. It's walking in respect to God. Did you know this morning that if God wanted to, if God saw fit, he could stuff my life out just like that. If God wanted to, he could never give me favor with man again or with God. But thank God for his graciousness and his goodness and his mercy. Walk in fear. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I was thinking the other day, and you can take this how you want to. Every person you see out on the streets here, we may call them street persons. I know them all by name. You know how I know them? You know how I know them? Because I stopped and talked to them. You know what they call me? Preacher. You know why? Because I want to tell you something. You get this down, don't you ever forget it? If it wasn't for the grace of God, that could very well be you or me. Right? Well, we forget that, don't we? We think we've raised ourselves up somewhere. I want to tell you something. We're nothing before a holy God. Nothing. Nothing. I know it was Brother Arnside that said in our bus meeting the other morning. I was introducing Brother Travis Williams as a preacher and Brother David as a preacher. And I said, and here's Stan Kennedy and here's Paul Bridges. They're nothing. And he said, they meet the qualification. He that plant is nothing. He that sows is nothing. <laughs> but God that gives the increase. That was the story I was looking for. If you want to be real, if you want to be rejoicing in affliction, if you want to be ready to give an answer, walk in humility, the next thing is, is live right before others. Look at verse number 16 with me, please. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation or your matter of life in Christ. When people look at you, if they say things about you, may they be things that will be false. You know what I'm saying? Live right before God. Live right before other people. Live, live, you know, let me tell you something. A guilty conscience is a terrible thing to live with, isn't it? Come on, isn't it? And you know when you you know when think, you know when God's speaking to your heart about something. You know when you are to quit. You know when you are to get right with somebody else, don't you? Yeah, you know. But you know what you want to do? You want to be like a good Baptist. Not me. Uh oh, I ain't going to no. Well, it, it's a terrible thing to live with a guilty conscience. Well, you know you are to get right. <laughs> Years ago, when I was helping a man build a church in Ohio. I, just, I got very upset with him. I mean, I did. He, he'd give me a paycheck and it would bounce. And I was living off of $25 a week trying to support my wife and children. I worked 54 hours a, at a service station making a dollar and a quarter an hour. And, it, and I'd get so frustrated with him. And it'd bounce and it, then it'd make my credit look bad because I, I had a check that bounced. I had to go to my landlord and say, my check bounced. I'm sorry, I'll do anything. And I, I said, I'll paint your house next month to pay for my rent. I think the rent was only $80 back then. I, was, I get so mad at him. So after a, about a week, I didn't even speak to him. I just, just mad. And God said, you, that's not right. He said, you ought to speak to him. He said, you ought to just tell him you're sorry. And I said, well, God, he did it, and I didn't. <laughs> you ever been there? And God said, but you ought to tell him you're sorry. And I went up to him, and I said, I want you to not treat you right for the last week. He said, I, he said, I know you haven't been right with God. He said, I'm glad you finally got right with God. Ooh, ooh. That's not the way to accept an apology. But won't you live a, listen to me, folks. People are never going to believe you're a Christian till you live like one. Amen? You wear the same garb, people. Why do we do that when we go to work? I mean, but I mean just totally get off, off course of not living holy and before, right before God. I'm going to tell you something. If we want to influence our society and our world for Christ, we got to live, live we got to act like Christians. Amen? There's so many things I can say. I need to give you two more and I'm through. If you want to be real in your 
walk in times of terror. If you want to be re rejoicing, you want to be ready, then I want you to also practice a fervent love. Look with me. Let me give you two more verses. First Peter chapter 4, please. First Peter 4, look at verse number 7. You're close by. It says, But the end of all things, wh where is it? Yeah. It's at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch in a prayer. And above all things, have what? Yeah. Fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sin. The end's at hand, and he said, above everything else, with the end time coming, God said that Christians are to learn to love each other more and more. Come on. Now listen to me. If I got to preaching on every sin up here, I'd get some amens. If I get to preaching about love, you want to be quiet. Now I want you to listen. I'm going to say three things, basically. I want to say about three or four things quickly. We're against abortions here because we believe that we believe that life begins at conception. But I want to tell you something. There's something wrong with us in our churches if we cannot love people that have had abortions. And wait a minute. And even love those that do it. Come on. Very hard. We're against pornography. I think it's a crying rotten shame that two-thirds of the Internet has to do with pornography. I think it's even more of a shame, and I won't say this till the day I die or till, I, till you kick me out of this church. It's a dirty, rotten, filthy shame for you men or if you women are guilty to lock yourself in your little rooms or your little booths and you get on the Internet and watch the filth and garbage you watch on tele with, with pornography. It's not right before God. And God doesn't like it, and God's not pleased with it. You understand that? But I want to tell you something. We ought to have compassion toward those that do so. Now, come on. Come on. Homosexuality. We believe, it's, we believe that sodomy is an abomination before God. That's what the Bible, we believe. That's what I preach. But I'm going to witness to every one of them I can. I'm going to tell them that Jesus loves them. He has the power to save them. And I've seen some of them saved by the grace of God. Come on, come on. Right. Wait, 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 wait. Hey, hey, hey. And listen, I believe that God ordained one man for one woman. I believe that's God's will. But I'm going to love people that have to face divorce. And I'll go as much as say this. I'm going to love them no matter what the cause is. Our love is so conditional sometimes. Because we want to love somebody else that only wants to love us in return. Isn't that pitiful? Listen to me now. Here's one of my favorite statements I read the other day, and I've said this two or three times. The world can out entertain us, and the world can outspend us. But the world should never outlove us. Mm. I got one more point before I do, though. I want you to stand up, turn around, tell somebody you love them. And I'll finish the point when you get through doing that. Stand up, tell somebody you love them. <laughs> love you too. Don't leave. We're going to take up another offering. <laughs> sit back down. All right, sit down. That's enough. That's enough of that stuff. <laughs> if you want to be real, if you want to be ready, if you want to rejoice in suffering, then you've got to learn to keep your hope up. Look at verse number 15. That asketh you a reason of the what? Hope. Amen. Well, we, I said I have one more point I got too. You just bear with me. Hope. Looking for that. Listen, hope. Did you know? Excuse me, I, I remind you of this every Sunday. I don't mean to, but just part of my life, part of my preaching, what's happened to me is happening with the fathers of the gospel. I've had 50 funeral services this year alone. When I'll go to that graveside this evening, we'll look at a casket. The word coffin is mentioned one time in the Bible, one time, Genesis chapter 50. You know what the word means? It means hope chest. That's <laughs> what it means. Hope chest. But it's not hope like you hope. It's where we get assurance from. It's assurance chest.
what we've planted is going to rise again. <laughs> Keep your hope up. Amen? Keep your hope up. Here's the last thing. Verse number 18. For Christ has also once suffered for sin the just for the unjust. He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit of God. Always keep the price Christ paid for you in front of you. If you're going to be real, if you're going to be able to rejoice in times of suffering, if you're going to be ready, you've got to keep the price that Christ paid for you in front of you. The Christ, the just for the unjust. Listen, he once suffered for sin, never to suffer again. His suffering was substitutionary, the just for the unjust. His, per, his suffering was, was merciful. Uh, it had a purpose to it that he might bring us to God. The only way you'll ever come to God is through the person of Jesus Christ. Don't forget the cross. Amen? I often remind myself, when I think I'm having to pay a little price or suffer a little bit, all I can do is think of Calvary. <laughs> that puts the issue behind me. Heard the story in closing of a man by the name of Martin Neumiller, N-E-I-N-M-U-L-L-E-R, who lived during the days of Nazi Germany, the days of Hitler. He was arrested. He was placed in a death camp. He said these words. First they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out, for I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I did not speak out, for I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out, for I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out. Where we are today, let's be real. Let's learn to rejoice in suffering. Let's be ready by those things which I've mentioned to you. Keep Christ special in your life. Ready to give an answer. Walk in humility. Live before others. Have a fervent love for each other and the lost. Abound in hope. Keep the cross of Christ before you while our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I guess I could close this sermon this morning, but just don't sit there and do something. We're going to sing the old rugged cross as an invitational song in just a few minutes. How many quickly would raise a hand and say, Pastor, thank God I know I'm saved. I know Christ lives in my heart. Would you raise your hand way up high and give me a word of testimony? Isn't it wonderful to know the Lord? To have him on our, have him, we're on his side, we're on the winning side. I wonder. Now let me ask you a question. How many say, Pastor, I know I'm saved, but as a Christian, I'm just going through some trying times in my life. Things have been very difficult. You're not complaining. You're just wanting someone to pray for you. Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm just, as a Christian, I'm just going through some very difficult times in my life. Would you pray for me? May God bless you. May God bless you and you and you and you and you and you. Others quickly, just let me pray for you. Father. Yes, God bless you. I see your hand. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, you've seen these hands and you know these hearts. Comfort these people. Help them in times of affliction. Help them to be real, though, and to rejoice in this time because you're able to be ready to give an answer. When folks ask them why you're still trusting, why you're still going on in times of adversity, help them, I pray. Could I get you? You don't have to do this. You could ask God right where you are. He'll help you. But could I get you to slip out of your seat? You raise your hand and said, Pastor, I want you to come just to ask God to help you publicly here somewhere. No one's going to ask you why you came. If you want to ask God to help you, I want to encourage you to do that. Slip out of your seat. Now, several hands were not raised a while ago. You're not, not sure if you, if you die. You'd go to heaven evidently. I want to tell you, God loves you. He's the just for the unjust. He died for you, and he wants to save you. I can't make you get saved. If I could, honestly, if I could, I'd make you get saved because I know it's so good, but I can't do that. I can't walk an aisle for you. I can't, have, I can't pray for you in the sense of praying that sinner's prayer for you. That's something you've got to do for yourself. But there are several people in this room whom I pray for daily. You need to trust Christ to save you. Would you do that this morning? Would you trust him who loves you and cares for you? Would you please do that this morning? Ask him to save you. If I can help you at the front, I'll be here. You need to rededicate your life to the Lord. I want you to come. You need to pray about something. I want you to come. The page is verse number 27. I think you know the song well enough to sing it by heart. I want you to stand with me. If you need to come as we stand, you keep on coming while we sing the first verse. You come while we stand, while we sing. You come. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame. Come on, sing it. And I love
Come on. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross Our heads are about our eyes are closed. In just a moment, in just a moment, they're going to sing one final verse. Listen. I think you're adult enough and you know what you are to respond to. And you know the Holy Spirit spoke into your heart. You need to respond to Him. That's all I'm asking you to do. If you're here and you've been saved, but you never made public in a church service what Christ has done for you, you ought to make it public this morning. If you need to get baptized, it's a time to get baptized. Or if this is the church family you are to be a part of, I want you to come on this verse. You need to come and talk to me about being saved. Whatever I can help you with this morning, I want you to do that. We'll sing this verse. You come while we sing this verse. You come. To the old cross, I will ever be true. Yes, come on. I'm waiting on you. You come on. Yes. Be seated just for a moment, please. I want to thank you for being here. After the service, if you need to see me, I'll be around here till I need to go home and have a bite to eat before I leave for a graveside service. Here's what I want you to do for me. If you're visiting with us today now, this is your first time or first time in a long time, we have a special gift we want to give to you. But you have to come to a room to get that gift. <laughs> so we're going to dismiss you right now. Are the gifts in that room waiting? You folks, I mean that. I've been your pastor for 12 years. We do this every Sunday night for 12 years. We sing and preach and go home. But you're faithful to come, and I want to tell you that I appreciate that. We're going to come by and shake Wayne's hand. I mean, I mean Jesse's hand now. <laughs> you over here, Jess. Come here, family over here with him, Brad, Arch. Let's get Archie and Bonnie up here, too, because I want everybody to shake Archie's hand. Uh, and Bonnie, and I'm sure that. Raymond Lois would like to have been here, but they just could not come. When you come by and shake Archie's hand when you do, tell him you're praying for him, all right? <laughs> but, you know, I think what we ought to do, he since he's this close to the front, he just ought to go ahead and get right with God, don't you? <laughs> Let's stand to our feet. We'll try to leave here. <laughs> Hoyt, come back up here and leave us in prayer. <laughs> Father, we thank you again for this day and your many blessings. Thank you for the service we had this morning and again tonight. Lord, help us to go home and learn to serve you better, go to work tomorrow serving you better at homes, wherever we're at. Bless us now as we go home in Jesus' name. Amen.
Is the volume all right? Okay. It's good to see your mother tonight here, Wayburn. I told her again. I'm glad she came. It's good to see you be able to come back too. But I don't want you wearing that coat anymore because I got one just like it. Okay, now we'll start. All right, here we go. I want to take just a few minutes to thank you for watching our television broadcast. I can't tell you what encouragement is to me as I visit or while I'm out in the public, so to say, that you say, I saw you on television and we enjoyed it. Thanks so much. I'll count all of you who are in our viewing audience as a friend. And I want to give you a special invitation to be our friend on April the 9th at 10.30 a.m. in the morning service is our annual friend day. Would you please be my guest on that day? Our hopes are to have over 900 people there for that special Sunday at Mount Pisgah Baptist Church, April the 9th, 1995, 10.30 a.m., Friend Day. Please be our friend. Okay? Then we'll, okay, I'm ready to go again. That sounded all right, didn't it? Okay. Also, we encourage you to join us on Resurrection Sunday, April the 16th. Celebrate with us the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's some other days of interest. I hope you'll take advantage of. Okay, excuse me. You wouldn't have time because it's the next. Okay. Okay, but the next Sunday is the 16th. So we wouldn't have time, actually, if you didn't put it on the next few tapes. That's what I was thinking. That's why I said also. You see what I'm saying? So I was going to let you edit out that little part where I paused, maybe, and just put also. And this all this will be all one commercial at the same time, what I was thinking. Okay, because what I was wanting to do, I was going to cover about a span of two months' time here, time I get through. Okay, so I just got to talking about, about Resurrection Sunday, right? Okay, I'm sorry. But, that, but I appreciate Lena. What, see, the last thing I said was Resurrection Sunday. <clears throat> May the 7th, I'll be celebrating my 30th anniversary of preaching. Well, I, I want you to be there for that. I want you to come. Uh, I had many people tell me when I first started out, I said, you won't make it. Uh, and I did make it by the help of God. And May the 7th, join us for this special day. And then many of you have asked us, when is the Cruz family coming back to sing for you? The Mexican uh, man with, with his boys that sang. such a blessing to us. I guess I heard as much compliments about that service as any that we've had. Well, they're going to be here for both services on Mother's Day, May the 14th, the morning service and evening service. Come and enjoy that blessed day with us also. And then here's a special offer that I want to give to you. For everyone that writes or calls, the number's on the screen, if you'll write or call us uh, between now and through May, we're going to be giving you this plaque. Here's a beautiful scripture plaque. It's yours absolutely free for writing us at the address on the screen or by calling us and giving us your address. We'll send it to you absolutely free. Thanks again for watching. May God bless you our prayer. That's it. What do you think? Okay. I practiced a little bit before you came, so I tried to get everything in I wanted to. Uh, what I was thinking about, uh, Lena, is I knew the way our tape rotated, but I didn't go ahead and all on there. Okay. 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 Will you do that for us? Let's have prayer together. Brother Mark Smith, you pray for us.